Chateau. Uh, my name is Christine. I'm the curator here at the museum. And we partnered with Open Air uh, two, two sessions ago. So this is our second round uh, year of Open Air Artists with Stony and their wonderful organization where we bring artists here to the museum. <coughs> Uh, the Clark Chateau is a local community and arts organization, and so we're run by Boots Silver Bow. We partner with Boots Silver Bow Public Archives, and so one of the main uses of this space is we do do tours. But a big way that we like to use this building as a community space is we invite artists into this space, and we do that by rotating art in the galleries. We host authors to give readings for their work here. We've hosted poets. We've hosted playwrights who are developing new material in the past and have done staged readings in the ballroom. So we really like to um, reach out to all different artists all across Montana all the time. And so this partnership with Open Air was really important to me when I found out about it and I reached out to Stony. And so we're really excited to have them in the building. And you know, if you don't know much about William Clark, uh, of course, he was a copper king, but another thing about William Clark that we don't talk about a lot in Butte is William Clark was actually a big, um, a really big collector of the arts. And so this building is part of that legacy. You know, William Clark in his day had a 2,000 piece art collection. Um, most of it was French. Um, it actually formed the heart of the Corcoran Museum in Washington, D.C. And then, um, and you know, this house he was a big fan of French art, and that is why he built a chateau here in the middle of Butte. Um, later, you know, Murray owned this property, and uh, James Murray was a big patron of the arts here in Montana. When he leased this building, it was the Butte College of Music. And so, uh, you know, also feeding into this legacy of like bringing the arts into Butte and supporting the arts here in Butte. And so I really love this continuation of this history through these partnerships with other organizations like Open Air. So I want to thank you all for coming today. And I've been really excited to work with Claire and Suzanne all this last month. It's been great getting to know them and getting to know their work. So thank you so much. And I've been okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. So I'm going to tell you about Claire. So Claire Thompson is a seasonal trail worker in the North Cascades and a fellow at the National Forest Foundation. She received her master's degree in environmental studies from the University of Montana and a graduate certificate in natural resources conflict resolution. With a background in journalism, Claire writes creative nonfiction that merges personal narrative with reporting, research, and lyrical approaches. Claire is drawn to the themes of disturbance and upheaval and looks for patterns and tensions between the ecological and the emotional. She is at work on a book that uses narratives of her trail work experiences to explore how changing fire regimes impact forests, public lands, and human connections to place and landscape. So, Hi everyone. Sorry, I have like some tea here that I'm going to try to drink without spilling it all over the equipment. Um, yeah, I guess just to start off, I wanted to share some visuals and give like a little more intro about myself and what I do and how I got here. Um, so, I grew up in Seattle um, and I've spent the past five years kind of bouncing between Missoula and the Washington Cascades where I work as a seasonal trail worker for the Forest Service. Um, so I've been near Butte, but not in Butte for a while. And one of the things that drew me to Butte is that um, my grandmother, Arlene Marie Grunstrom, as she was uh, as a child, she then was twice divorced and once widowed, so hence the three <laughs> additional names. Um, she grew up here in Butte, um, and her father also grew up here. Um, she was part of a community of Finnish copper miners um, back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and yeah, so I've always, Butte has sort of always loomed large in my family imagination. And one thing I want to acknowledge is that I think being here, um, it's been kind of a more complicated emotional process um, engaging with my family history than I expected. Um, you know, I think when I went to the archives and was looking at my grandma's senior yearbook, which this is from, and looking through the directories, 
of all the addresses where they lived growing up, um, I felt a lot more sadness than I had expected. Um, and it kind of, I do feel like there's been a little bit of a heaviness to this place for me, um, just thinking about all of this family history that has now kind of disappeared in various ways. Um, all of the first maybe six places that my grandma lived um, are now in the Berkeley pit. Um, they moved around a lot in the Depression and lived in a bunch of thin town apartments. Um, and she also died relatively young of Alzheimer's disease, and her parents died before I was born of emphysema and Parkinson's, and yeah, there's just kind of a lot of he more heavy stuff than I had acknowledged, and it's something I've really been thinking about a lot as an environmental writer is kind of how do we move beyond extractive economies and find a way to build up communities that is also not extractive or exploitive in a way. I think a lot of times there's this instinct to pivot to tourism or the recreation economy, um, which to me can feel extractive in its own way, um, in the way that it can sort of appropriate the real experiences of people who lived real lives in a place. But anyway, that's a, <laughs> I find it hard to write about things like while I'm actually experiencing them. So I think that's something I'm gonna be processing for a while and trying to sort of work out is like my complex feelings about my family and you. Um, but on from that, speaking of being an environmental writer, I think that word carries a lot of assumptions. The term environmentalism carries a lot of assumptions. So I just want to share this sticker, sticker, which I absolutely adore. Um, and I think part of my approach to environmental studies and writing is to really try to move beyond assumptions and polarizations and really engage with the actual practical realities of people's experience on the ground um, and to recognize that solving wicked problems um, pretty much always is going to involve a compromise where not everyone's going to get what they want. Oops. Sorry, I'm like very bad at technology. Uh, there we go. Okay. I also feel like I'm talking too much and want to get to the reading part, but I just wanted to share a few pictures of what trail work looks like. I write about it and talk about it a lot, and sometimes I forget that like that's not a job most people see on a daily basis. Um, so the bulk of what I do on a trail crew is cutting logs. Um, yeah, that's pretty much most of our work is just opening up trails. After the winter, every winter, a bunch of trees come down in winter storms, and we have to open, up, open them up. So if it's a trail outside the wilderness, we can use chainsaws. If it's inside the wilderness, we have to use a crosscut saw because you can't use mechanized equipment in the wilderness. Um, yeah, so sometimes we cut really big logs. This one took like a few hours. I don't think you can see in that picture, but one thing that was super cool about this cedar was that it was just gushing water the entire time we were cutting it. There's like some little drops of water you can sort of see. But like I was cutting this log for like hours and my pant leg was just like soaked with like water and cedar gunk, which was crazy. So yeah, you spend a lot of time just like in one random place in the forest cutting a log and you kind of notice all of these things that you wouldn't if you were just even hiking through, which is one of my favorite things about it. This is the, the finished product <laughs> of that cedar. Um, and then one thing I've been writing about a lot, as Kelly mentioned in the intro, is just how wildfire is affecting trail work. Um, our wildfire regimes are changing, fire is getting kind of more severe, bigger, hotter, um, and it really affects the way we do our work. So luckily this is an area outside the wilderness so we could use chainsaws, but you can see me making a face about how I felt after hiking through <laughs> this landscape for several hours trying to carry a chainsaw where there was no trail whatsoever. It was all just these little saplings and like jackstraw trees and like, at this point we had like given up on even working. We just had to like hike out to get out before dark and like we were just trying to climb over all these logs. Um, so these last ones are just some pictures of the landscape I'm going to be reading about, just so you sort of have a visual. Um, this is the Entiat Valley in north central Washington, so it's sort of southwest of Lake Chelan, if that means anything to you, kind of like between Wenatchee and Chelan. Um, these are some pictures from September when it was smoky and some fall color, and this is earlier in the season when there was still a bunch of snow on the mountains, and um, it's a landscape that's been burned pretty se severely several times over the last um, 10 or 20 years, so that's kind of what it looks like. Okay, now I'm going to read. Um, I'm like, let's see if that over slightly. There we 
I'm super curious. <laughs> okay. I think that'll work. <laughs> um, I've never read aloud anything that I've written that no one else has seen or given me feedback on, which is what this is. So it's a little scary. <laughs> one of my favorite writing teachers always told us not to apologize for our work, but that's exactly what I'm doing right now. <laughs> um, fresh. And it's not finished yet, but yeah. <clears throat> so it doesn't have a title. For ten miles, we followed tracks in the dust. Along the first four miles, boot prints and tire tracks, mountain bike and motorcycle, mingled with dainty deer hooves and the semi-ovals of shoed stock, the dust thick and deep and chewed up from so much use, soft to slog through. We'd gotten too late a start for such a hot day, and we paused only a mile from the trailhead in an island of unburned fur to relish the last shade we'd see for a long time. Four and a half miles in, we hit the wilderness boundary, and the tire tracks disappeared. Half a mile later, past the Larch Lakes Junction, most of the boot prints vanished too. On the newly uncrowded canvas of scorched dirt, our eyes found the paw prints. Savannah is 10 years my junior and from Iowa, but she grew up the daughter of an avid sportsman, a Cuban-American transplant from Miami who fell in love with the plains, and she knows more about wild animal sign than I do. She explained the difference between feline and canine tracks. Cats retract the claws at the end of each toe pad. Dogs don't. Alone and not knowing any better, I would have assumed these tracks belonged to a cougar, slinking around the tumbled boulders and between charred trunks, watching us pass from a hidden vantage, her coat blending perfectly with the beige landscape left by the fires. Four years ago, around the same time of year, I heard a cougar screaming as the crew and I hiked down into the freshly burned Jack Creek drainage off Stewart Pass. We paused at the corners of switchbacks that offered views into the valley below, trying to discern the direction of the screams. No one other than us had been up the valley since the fire the year before. As we descended out of the timber into the hotter part of the burn, we saw the cat's tracks clear and deep in the dust. And although we didn't hear her scream again, I found myself looking over my shoulder, the corners of my eyes catching movement in the margins as the evening shadows descended. But these tracks in the Antioch, Savannah pointed out, were crowned with claw marks. That would have to be one huge dog, she said, and we remembered the story Denton told us about how, late last season, camped 17 miles from the road at the dead end of this drainage, he and the crew heard wolves howling in the night. The Antioch Valley had been crowded with hunters that evening in early fall, the only time of year people flock to this place in any significant numbers. Maybe some of them think the burn, the lack of shade that deters hikers, will make it easier to see and shoot game. Others have simply been hunting in this place for generations, and the changing landscape hasn't changed family tradition. Other parties heard the wolf song too, wrote about it on the internet, corroborating each other's stories. But as of that time last year, this range officially hosted no confirmed local pack, and nobody got any pictures. Savannah and I kept following the tracks mile after mile, past Snowbrushy Creek, which in June had been so high water spilled over the crossing log, and we'd had to scramble upstream from the trail to find a different down trunk to straddle and scoot across, passing the crosscut saw and Pulaski to each other from one end to the other. Now in August, we crossed the dry log at the trail over a benevolent burble and paused on the other side to wet our ball caps and bandanas before pressing on in the afternoon heat. The temperature in town that day was close to 100, as it had been for most days for over a month. By September, I'd welcome a high of 90 in the forecast as a relief. The heat and the silence pressed in, not a riffle of a breeze, not that any foliage remained for a breeze to riffle through. No birdsong, no skittering of squirrels. There isn't much this landscape offers to anything alive. For a couple of miles past Snowbrushy, I tried to pass the time by counting how many seedlings I could find scattered in the dust. Sometimes five minutes went by without a single sighting. It's been seven years, but in parts of this burn, the forest struggles even to produce brush. Denton told us his dad said that back in the day, the Eniat River Trail was a tunnel of trees. In addition to the animal tracks, the burn has revealed wide open vistas of the country surrounding us. The jagged towers of granite called Devil's Smokestack, Rampart Mountain, 5th of July, Spectacle Buttes, and the waterfalls that pour off the ridge to the west. I've hiked the first five miles of this trail a half dozen times this season already, each time tracking the flow of each falls, the spilling surf that diminishes just a little more as the rush of early season snowmelt recedes and more weeks tick by without rain. Sometimes I hear funny things in the forest. Maybe you do too. 
Usually, I chalk it up to the unexpected sonic combinations of trees and tumbling creek and critters, a layered soundtrack surprisingly inconsistent and eerily verbal, like a whispered conversation behind a closed door, voices you're not meant to hear. Sometimes I blame low-level heat exhaustion or low blood sugar or the paranoia of insomnia. That afternoon, as Savannah and I trudged gradually uphill through the dust that seemed to gather and radiate back the scorching August sun, eyes peeled for the best preserved tracks, I thought at one point that I heard a faint commotion somewhere far across the valley, a sound my brain wanted to identify as high-pitched yelps and lower grumbles. Savannah was hiking too far ahead for conversation, outpacing me and reminding me which side of 30 I stood on. I said nothing <laughs> about the sound. We listened but heard no howlings that night or the nights after. The next day brought a layer of clouds that took the edge off the heat, sparing us the desperate need for shade, but the brush down near the bottom of Ice Creek seemed to hold moisture and offer it back in the form of sweat. The day after that it rained, just a little, a strange, sticky, humid rain not usual for these arid mountains. It came down from clouds that mingled with the wildfire smoke working its way over from neighboring valleys, a hybrid haze of weather, past and present. On our way up to Ice Lakes, we traveled through a mile or two of intact, unburned forest below the tree line, thick-trunked old-growth fir and spruce, shading a spacious understory of huckleberry and ferns, the trail firm dirt again. I walked through the living forest as if bobbing on the current of a gentle river, grinning, floating with the joy like coming home. I hiked out alone the following day, leaving Savannah to meet up with another intern to finish the log out. Duty called me out of the woods, emails to answer, arrangements to be made, and reward, a bed to share. The sun burned hot again in the cloudless sky, and by 10 a.m. I was sweat-soaked enough to strip to my underwear and plunge under the icy Antiat River before facing the worst of the hike out. My foot footprints fell fresh in the rain-cleaned dust. A bear had wandered on and off the trail before me, the only other creature to leave a trace since the drizzle. The wolf, its tracks, nowhere to be seen. I always wanted to believe in ghosts, in the possibility of haunting, the connection between this world and the next. As a kid, I clamored to read the books of scary stories I found in my school library, to swap spooky tales with friends, to watch any horror movie my parents deemed appropriate. But every ghost story I gobbled up was inevitably followed by the regret of sleepless nights, blankets pulled over my head, my body tensed against the darkness. I knew the terror would come and I let it, like a drunk accepting a hangover in advance. I longed for my own ghost story, but I could never quite get myself to believe the ones I dreamed up. I was both disappointed and relieved by the non-spookiness of the real world. These days, I choose to trust most adults who tell me about their ghostly encounters but I've still never had any myself. I find it easier to embrace the unexplainable out in the woods and the wild places. In the realm of non-human hauntings, I feel more fascination than fear. The known presence of mountain lions and wolves is just a little spine tingling in its realness. But the forest also harbors feelings and forces beyond human capacity to explain, at least in a Western scientific context. The collective consciousness of an interconnected system allows room for things we can sense without needing to understand. I believe the stories people tell me about the mysteries of the wild, and I look for my own mysteries. At dusk on Ice Creek, bats flit back and forth before the silhouettes of two trees, two old spruces side by side, nearly identical in size, shape, and age, except one is standing dead, no needles, just brittle gray branches, while its dark green sibling appears perfectly healthy. Lightning, fire, insect, drought, whatever it was that touched one spruce, why did it skip the other? If I were a scientist, maybe I'd have a way of finding out. But not knowing is reassuring in its own way. I'd rather believe that even the elegance of nature can't exclude random shit luck. I told my boss about the tracks when I got back to the ranger station, careful not to sound too sure, too sure of their source. Savannah thought they had claw marks, I said. I guess it could have been a really big dog. There's a confirmed wolf pack in the Enyat now, as of last winter, John said. They're calling it the Shady Pass Pack. According to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Shady Pass Pack includes a minimum of four wolves, with no known breeding pairs yet. In May, fish and wildlife biologists captured and collared three wolves from the pack, which will allow them to better define the pack's range by tracking the movements of the collared wolves. The northeast corner of Washington state is home to a dozen or more wolf packs, which have shifted and dispersed over the years, bit by bit, establishing new packs farther afield. 
Here in central Washington, the territory of the Shady Pass Pack, by contrast, appears relatively isolated. The closest other existing wolf packs are to the northeast, on the other side of Lake Chelan, deep, cold, and flanked by steep mountains, and to the southwest in the Tianue River country, a hundred miles and several subranges away. Maybe the wolves have come here for the same reason as the hunters, to seek an advantage in the territory opened up by so many recent fires. The size of any given pack's range, while fluid, is also determined by the availability of prey, and perhaps also by the likelihood of predation from humans. The Eniat Mountains are remote, rugged, and sprawled entirely across public land. The approximate territory of the Shady Pack, unlike that of many other wolf packs in the state, does not overlap with any Forest Service grazing allotments. They may have traveled far to get here, but the wolves that established the Shady Pack can now roam with far less risk of deadly conflict. But they'll only stick around if they can find enough to eat. Wildfires as severe as the several that have burned through the Antiat in the last two decades can disrupt forest succession. If grasses and brush don't grow back fast enough, deer and elk may not return in enough numbers to support a wolf pack, or other predators for that matter. Even the hunters this year, when we patrolled the upper drainage in mid-September, seemed collectively to not be having much luck. Maybe it was just a weird year, ecologically out of whack, with the cold late spring followed by an abrupt shift to another relentless scorching summer. Maybe it was coincidence. Maybe they were, as a lot, just not very good hunters. Or maybe there are fewer, fewer deer these days as the forest struggles to recover. Maybe what few there are, the wolves got to first. As wolves reestablish in Washington, over 200 of them at last count, more every year for over a decade now, some areas of the state, like the corner near the borders with Idaho and Canada, may already be reaching the limits of the wolf population they can support. Every year, individual wolves strike out alone, leaving their packs in search of new territory. The more crowded some places become, the farther the lone wolves may roam. Five years ago, a male wolf was confirmed west of the Cascade Crest for the first time since the 1930s, traveling in the Dioxid <coughs> Creek area. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Anyone knows, tell me. <laughs> um, in the upper Skagit Valley, just outside North Cascades National Park. The game camera photo of the wolf is grainy and out of focus, but it's in color, and the unmistakable west side flora surrounding the wolf makes my heart pound. Sword ferns crowd the foreground, middle, and blurry background of the photo. Thick moss drapes over branches sticking in from the side of the frame. It's hard to tell, but the wolf stands in, what looks, in front of what looks like the limbs of a droopy western red cedar. The photo captures the dappled light and sharp contrasts of sun filtered through temperate forest, and I can almost smell it, the thick, moist leaf litter beneath the wolf's feet, the moss and soil steaming as the morning warms, so many things decomposing and growing all at once, the signature scent of the forest I grew up in. <laughs> Before wolves were extirpated from Washington State a century ago, the last hangers-on lived not in northeastern Washington, the most popular wolf habitat today, but on the opposite side of the state, in the deep, damp forests of the Olympic Peninsula. The final confirmed wolf killings here occurred in habitat more like Diopsid Creek than the arid piney hills near the Idaho Panhandle. As wolves have repopulated naturally in Washington, making their way south and west from British Columbia and Montana, the Olympics remain a distant outpost, a homeland rendered unreachable by a gauntlet of urban sprawl. By a second winter in the Diopsid, the lone male wolf had found a mate, which biologists managed to collar. The pair made a pack, but the excitement was short-lived. The female's radio collar died, and it's been a couple of years since biologists have been able to say for sure that two wolves still roam the diopsid. Game cameras have only captured images of one at a time. The size of every pack and its range shifts and fluctuates, sometimes passing in and out of existence altogether, at least according to wildlife managers' definition of what constitutes a pack, two or more wolves traveling together in winter. Packs are declared and declarations rescinded based on these parameters. Official estimates of Washington's wolf population are necessarily conservative, in keeping with the tendency of scientists to couch their hunches in layers of caution and qualifications and possible exceptions to rules. But scientific restraint has a way of stoking imaginations, expanding mysteries. Unless a wolf is spotted alive and later confirmed dead, the inability to guarantee its presence does not, by default, confirm its non-existence. You can't prove a negative. Once known wolves, like the diopsid female, disappear from the record. Non-collared wolves pass in front of game cameras in snowy winter woods, 
far from any confirmed pacts, their identities, loyalties, and trajectories left to speculation. So far, these solitary travelers appear to be just that, only passing through, part of the winter palette in the grainy black and white footage. One wildlife camera in the Chihuahua Mountains has captured multiple photos in recent winters of a single black wolf, identity and origins unknown. One of these shots is a color image, crisp, clear, entirely in focus. A large, a large swath of the Chihuahuans burned severely in 2014, and the wolf matches the color of the slender, charred trunks behind it, the wolf in the trees, deep, dark against the deep snow. Falling flakes frozen in midair stand out against the wolf's fur. It faces the camera, mouth open, teeth on full display, eyes clear and bright, its right forepaw just barely lifted out of the snow, as if caught mid-step. <clears throat> Unconfirmed reports of wolves or their sign have come from as far south as the northeast foothills of Mount Rainier. How many more wander the mountains without detection at all? When the Department of Fish and Wildlife releases its annual reports on wolf populations, their word choice in highlighting the minimum number of wolves leaves open a tantalizing door. Surely there are more wolves than we can or will ever know. There are so many things for which we seek answers, and answers we've been taught are out there if we know where to look, which sources to trust. Western science has a way of becoming its own dogma when positioned opposite of religion, of provincial faith, and folk tales. Indigenous knowledge, which trusts based on generations of intimacy with land, what Western science requires be proven in controlled experiments, allows for the unknown. Great is the mystery of faith, we'd recite in church before communion, but mystery belongs in many dimensions, inside and out of us, in science and in spirituality. We want to know what the weather will be like for our hike or our hunt this weekend. We want to know when the larches change color on a particular ridge, whether the snow on the bowl we hope to ski tomorrow will be powder or corn. We want to know why the air quality is so bad for the 17th day in a row, which fire or fires all this smoke is coming from, when it will blow the other direction, why the firefighters can't stop it. We demand answers, but we only accept certain ones. We don't want to hear that smoky summers are our future, not in this corner of the Northwest where the summers are so shining and pristine, the reason everyone west of the Cascades sticks it out through nine months of rain. We don't want to hear that only weather, not firefighters, can fully drown the blazes and scatter the smoke, and none of us can control the weather. We don't want to hear the truest thing, the answer to most questions, the answer all of our ancestors lived with and accept a recent century or two of technical dominance. The answer being that there are so many things we'll just never know for sure. describing the landscape, um, how are you making sure that that accuracy lands on the page? Mm. Um, I write in my journal a lot when I'm working. It's actually like the time that I write in my journal the most because it's like there's nothing to do after work in the backcountry besides write and read. So yeah, I rely on a lot of journal entries and I take photos and when I am like writing description I will like go back and look at photos a lot. Um, but I think also like a lot of the places I write about are places that I have just like spent a lot of time in. And so some of it is just pretty imprinted in my memory. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious about the intersection of your work and your writing work, mm -hmm. your out in the field work, and also how long continuously are you out in the field are you all summer out in the field, or just a couple days, or weeks, or...? Yeah, the kind of typical schedule is we do like eight days on, six days off. 
So we'll be out in the field at most for eight days, um, but sometimes like we'll be one place for a few days, like come back to town and go to another place for a few days. Um, kind of in the past couple years, as I've like been saddled with more supervisory responsibilities, <laughs> I've spent less time in the field as I used to. Um, but yeah, I think this summer the most was like, the most I was out was like four or five days at a time. Um, does it spin the whole summer or? Oh yeah, like, there's another part of your question. Um, we usually, the season starts like May um, and then we'll go through September or as late as like the end of October. Um, and like early and late season, we'll do a lot more day trips. Um, and then, but kind of like June, July, August and beginning of September is like a lot of backpacking. Yeah. To clarify my question, did you start writing after you started? Or did you choose forestry work so you oh, thought you could have time to write and have mm -hmm. insights to your interests? So which came first? Yeah, how I did that evolve. I definitely chose writing first. Um, I went to journalism school as an undergrad um, and did that for a couple years, um, but then. Yeah, I actually got into trail work because I was really sick of writing and of staring at a computer. Um, and I just like wanted to, I just, this was like how it all started like 10 years ago, but I just like really needed a change. So I was like, what's the thing I can think of that's like the farthest opposite of what I'm doing now? And did that. And then I think over the years, um, it's more in the past like really just like five or six years that I've come to sort of appreciate how doing that like gives space for writing and like inspires me in the off time but but I didn't yeah for the first few years I was doing it I wasn't writing at all other than in my journal let's do that I have a question so uh in your writing you talk about how you write a lot about um, you know, your interest in these environmental issues and topics would you say that that's something that happened because of the forestry work mm -hmm. or is that something that you've always been interested in writing about well, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think kind of both. Like, I feel like I was al I always liked being outside and hiking and camping, and um, but yeah, that was sort of you know I grew up in Seattle in like the '90s and early 2000s, and it was like a very particular type of environmentalism that I was sort of like steeped in growing up, like WTO protests and like just a very kind of polarizing, um, yeah, version of it, I would say. Um, and so, yeah, I always sort of maybe like resisted that label a little bit, not because I didn't care about and love the environment, but um, yeah, anyway, but I think where I'm going with this is I always loved being outside, I guess, and I had the great fortune to grow up a block away from an incredible urban park um, called Seward Park in Seattle, if any of you are familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, but I think definitely doing trail work, like, yeah, like for sure I learned so much and I think that really changed things because I was learning things by like actually being a part of them instead of just like being at my desk on my computer and like calling people and like writing stories and like, yeah, just, um, I think, and I think there's something, I mean, this definitely is like over romanticizing <laughs> what I'm about to say, but I think there is something about actually like working on a landscape too. And I think trail work has this really, it offers this really unique way of engaging, kind of like I was saying with the cedar tree, because like when you're hiking, you just hike and you like stop at a place that's pretty or a place that's like a good place for a break. But when you're doing work, you just like stop whenever there's work to do. And sometimes it's like a really shitty spot that you wish you didn't have to crouch in for like two hours <laughs> sawing a log. But then you start to like notice all the details of what's around you. Um, but I also think working for the Forest Service, I really realized how like incredibly dysfunctional our <laughs> system of land management is in this country. And that definitely inspired me to like go to grad school and kind of, yeah, you know. Talk to other people who are the same. Sounds like you could have like a beer about it. Or yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a lot of soapboxes I could climb on right now, so restrain me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in this piece, um, it was evident that you've spent quite a bit of time contemplating the presence of wolves specifically in these wild areas. And 
It's always fascinated me that among certain segments of our population, um, wolves seem to attract uh, a, a, a kind of animosity that, that it's always seemed to me as completely disproportionate to their actual threat. Have you thought about that, about why that might be? Yeah. I've never been, I guess I'm asking because I've never been, I've never been able to wrap my mind around totally. it. Totally. Right? Yeah, I was definitely aware, the wolf thing was like a rabbit hole that I went down super recently and then like started doing research and I was like, and then I was like, yeah, whoa. Wolves are like a whole thing. I don't know if I want to like step into this. Um, but yeah, and I even like I had a line in here that sort of addressed that, and I like took it out and chose not to read it because I was like, maybe that'll like set someone off in the audience. Um, didn't want to be. But yeah, um, I I don't have any original thoughts about it. But have you read the Barry Lopez book of Wolves and Men? My boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, should I? I yeah, think, okay. I recommend it. It's really interesting because it was written in the 70s, so like when wolves like did not exist anywhere in the lower 48, mm -hmm. except some like really extreme pockets. But yeah, the part of it I'm in right now, like he goes deeply sort of into like all the kind of like psychological, hmm. spiritual, religious, colonialist roots of, um, yeah of like that sort of out of proportion reaction and the way like wolves to some I mean in some traditions they were like revered and then in other traditions they were like very much associated with the devil literally mm -hmm. and like the like dark part of the untamed wilderness. So it's really cool, yeah, I recommend it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One more and then you can tell me but yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, going back to where you started your talk with coming to Butte and researching yeah. your family history. Um, and it's, you've been using your time here to write this and you mentioned that that's heavy and will take time to process, but I'm curious, what has been your process of document, like are you journaling around that? How are you sort of pre-writing pre or preparing for what's to come as you're learning all these things? Yeah, um, <laughs> I guess like one day after I went to the archives, I like wandered around and I got to that point where I was having like so many thoughts in my head where I was like, I just need to like sit down and like free, free write a little, like just to like remember what I'm thinking. So yeah, I like scribbled a bunch of things and then, and then went back to my computer and started like trying to write and then I was like, well, I'm not ready for this yet, but I just kind of like wrote some ramblings. That's usually how I start, it's just long ramblings <laughs> yeah. and like try to... Do you think, given the environmental, you know, obviously, um, considerations of your writing, that the compromised nature of the city of Butte will play a role in that narrative? Or is it really going to be more like family? Mm. Oh, I think they're like, for sure, like super related. Yeah. Like, I think that was like a big part of my attraction to this residency. Yeah, and my like unexpected reaction to how the family stuff mm -hmm. kind of hit me um, was just like, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, all of the everything I've been hearing about Butte's past and present and future just seemed like so personal. Um, yeah, sounds so natural. It's good. Can you have a question? Maybe I'll treat it. Oh, I sort of had a process question about when you're writing in your journal, how how much of that uh, direct raw writing ends up in the, your final product? Your not versus, much. Not much? Yeah. <laughs> and, and sort of, I guess I was wondering how much it sort of gets romanticized in your process versus like your, your raw notes. Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe like, well, okay, maybe, no, this is on OCD, I don't know if <laughs> I have like different levels of like, so my journal journal is just like me rambling, like stream of consciousness. And then I usually also have a notebook going that's like slightly more formulated thoughts. And like, that's more what like the stuff, and then when I'm like sitting down at the computer, then I'm like, all right, this is real. And so usually like, the notebook is stuff that I'm writing more sort of like trying it out and thinking how it would fit in an essay. But the journal is like super personal, but I think it does, it just helps me remember. Um, and maybe sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I have fun with it. And I'm like, oh, that was a nice turn of phrase. <laughs> 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 
but sometimes it's very ridley. So. so is it kind of like how artists use sketchbooks? You know, I have a Probably. sketchbook where it's just like weird nonsense. You know, yeah. Sometimes it's a grocery list, and yeah. sometimes it's like weird phrases. Sometimes it's drawing. Sometimes I plan out a whole painting, and very very little of what's in my sketchbook equals art that people see that I show. Yeah, yeah. Is it kind of like that? Feel? I think so. Oh. Yeah. It's sort of. I mean, it's like I always think about it as like. You know, if you're an athlete, you have to like do drills and practice that are like not things you actually do in competition, but that mm -hmm. like help you exercise those muscles. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Claire. Thank you.